Good evening, colleagues and guests. My name is Ilke Machold. I'm the PVC for Research and Innovation, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you uh, this evening to Leeds Beckett University and to the inaugural lecture of Professor Shane Yuan, Professor of History in our School of Humanities and Social Sciences. Professor Yuan's research and teaching interests coalesce around urban history and the politics and culture of disasters and emergency preparedness. He is the co-editor of Urban History, the leading academic journal in the field, and he's also co-editor, sorry, co-investigator on the Arts and Humanities Research Council project titled Forged by Fire, Burns Injury and Identity in Britain from 1800 to 2000. And uh, when you've come in, there is uh, a, br a brochure in relation to this project. Professor Ewan has worked alongside the Fire and Rescue Service in England and Scotland, the Fire Brigades Union, Burns Charities and several schools to deliver novel educational and community engagement resources. Through his work, he seeks to use his expertise to positively impact communities by raising awareness of the personal and community safety measures throughout historical stories using the linked practices of co-creation, collaboration, and commemoration to inspire change amongst young people. In his inaugural lecture, Professor Ewan will discuss how histories of fires and burns have been used to inspire creative learning, especially amongst school children in urban communities shaped by their experiences with fire. During this event, he will consider the personal and collective tragedies involving burning and scalding, which have been rooted in the everyday life, practices and spaces of communities throughout the past two centuries in Britain. Colleagues and guests, it gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Shane Ewan to present his inaugural professorial lecture. Thank you very much, Silke, for a very kind and warm introduction. And I'm very sorry, I was, I was tasked with the clicker and I was supposed to click on it when you were talking, but I left it up the front. So anyway, there'll be a lot of, there'll be a lot of faux pas, I'm sure. Um, thank you. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming along this evening. I'm really quite touched and quite flattered and humbled by it all. I never expected kind of expected about half a dozen people to turn out just out of pity. Um, it means an awful lot. It, it really does mean an awful lot. Um, I can't thank you all personally, or not during, not during the next 40 minutes, but there's a few people I just want to thank up front um, by name. Um, my PhD supervisor, Richard Roger over there, Travel, yeah, traveling all the way down from Scotland. Richard started me on my journey many, many years ago now. Um, thank you for coming. Um, all my students, all the students here, past and present, this is brilliant. This is really inspiring for me. Thanks for coming along and thanks for your encourage encouragement over the years. And then I just want to say a special thank you to my Forged by Fire teammates. And they are mates. So Jonathan Reinhardt's. Aaron sitting at the back as always, Aaron Andrews um, and Rebecca Winter. Rebecca can't be here today. She's in Amsterdam. She's got a great job there. She is watching back on the video link. So hello, Rebecca. <laughs> and then thanks as well. Um, Irene Lofthouse, uh, Rachel Wood, uh, who can't be here today, and Marcus Lee, the brilliant team who have done such fantastic work for us with the school's engagement side of the project. And then also I'll, I'll, um, I'll thank David Jackson and Julianne Muir, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service Community Safety Leads, who have been really good in the last sort of six months or so with us, Jonathan. And finally, last but not least, I need to thank my wife, Sarah, and my son, Jarvis, for keeping my feet firmly on the ground and for giving me a kick up the backside when I get a bit grumpy about some of the stuff I'm going to tell you about today. So anyway, I'm going to begin with a short story. And I'm really sorry, but it's not, it doesn't have a happy ending. But then very few of my stories do, because we are looking at the history of mass fatality fires and burning and scalding incidents. But please bear with me, all right? 
absolutely. Thank you for that, Simon. It's not put me off at all. Um, on a freezing cold morning in November 1905, a fire broke out in a converted warehouse in central Glasgow. And it gutted the four stories of the premises. So far, no surprise. Glasgow was known as Tinderbox City at the time. It's a city synonymous with fire, um, both equally as a source of production and comfort, but also destruction. In this case, the warehouse had been converted into a model lodging house by its owner, who'd put in a basic standard of accommodation for the city's poor and homeless. So the landlord had basically installed seven foot squared wooden cubicles into the property to pack as many residents in as he, as he could. Lodging houses were, no, uh, you know, were popularly known as DOS houses, poor man's hotels and such like. They were, they were aimed at the very poor. Um, each, each cubicle came with a mattress and a blanket and they were based on a style that was very popular on emigrant ships, so they were known on the banks of the Clyde. There were 380 men in residence on the night of the fire, largely itinerant workers who'd been drawn to the city for steady work. All were turfed out in the middle of the night. We're looking at about four o'clock in the morning. It's freezing cold. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big fog. All were turfed out onto the street, as you can see them kind of massing, amassing here. Some of them were naked, apart from their boots. They were frog marched to the nearest police station, um, given blankets, and then sent to local workhouses across the city for rehousing. They were the lucky ones. <laughs> 39 men never made it out that night. In fact, it's a miracle so few died because there was a single wooden lined um, staircase in and out of the, of the property. So it's, it's, you know, it's lucky. Residents from the top floor had to, had to make their escape by smashing um, their way through a skylight and climbing out onto the roof. And they used the crutch of a disabled resident um, to do that. Newspapers paid little attention to the identities of the 39 men or even frankly the survivors. All they kind of generally said was that they were aged between 21 and 70. They were predominantly Scottish or Irish. They were all men and they were all poor. The victims were identified by the very few objects they had in their cubicles and they were all given pauper burials. Glasgow and Watson Street in particular had a large number of lodging houses single sex lodging houses, um, aimed at those who couldn't afford more secure housing. Thousands of Glaswegians slept in them every night at the turn of the century. And this is replicated across a lot of, a lot of industrial cities up and down the country. Such was the scale of the problem that the city's improvement commissioners had taken over regulation of lodging houses a few years earlier largely so that they could enforce standards of public, public health and hygiene and also the respectability, the morality of the residents. There was never anything said about fire safety. Okay. Now, I've known about Watson Street for quite a few years now, having first researched it for my first book, Fighting Fires, which was published um, 13 years ago. In in 2017, after the appalling fire at Grenfell, I was invited by BBC Radio 4 to appear on their, their flagship history show, The Long View, <clears throat> to talk about the history of mass fatality domestic fires. And my immediate thought at this time turned back to Watson Street, because I thought there was an interesting analogy to be drawn here about how um, the marginalised and, you know, are, are, are treated um, when it comes to fire safety. Caveat. No two fires are ever the same, right? Um, in this instance, Watson Street had occurred in a converted building, um, Gren, you know, um, available basically as, a, as, a, as temporary lodgings. Grenfell happened in a refurbished one. But anyway, I enjoyed doing the episode. I was particularly struck by the fact that the programme makers flew us all to Glasgow in order to record on location, which struck me as a little bit odd for a radio show, but it was a free trip. Um, and, and I was really pleased at how seriously they were taking the issues. Um, and so we, we recorded in the city chambers, we recorded on Watson Street and other kind of key um, 
or you know, sites to create an air of authenticity, and I think they did a really good job. This reinforced my view that the spaces within which such events unfold are an important part of the story. You know, they're sites, as we saw in the, in the newspaper cartoon, they're sites of spectacle, of risk, of rescue, but they're also sites of public memory. And in this instance, of forgetting, because Watson Street has never been formally commemorated by the City Council, the Fire Service, or any, anybody. So I thought that was quite interesting. Now, the podcast is still online if anybody wants to take a listen. In the wake of the programme airing, we commissioned our project artist, Sarah Taylor Silverwood, to create a graphic novel story um, around this fire, amongst, amongst others. Graphic novels are a really good way of combining images and text in order to engage um, young readers who might not be used to reading text-heavy material, but would be a bit more confident and a bit more comfortable about reading that hybrid style of text and image. And they're also really good for introducing weighty or sensitive topics, especially in a historical context. They've been used to good effect, some of you might know, by graphic novelists like Art Spiegelman um, and Joe Sacco to tell stories, to, 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 to reveal hidden dark histories about things such as the Holocaust and the Great War. And their use is now a recognised form of historical pedagogy. And I'm really excited that from September, I've got a brand new second year module coming on the books, a social history of medicine in Britain module, where we're going to be using this, our graphic novel, as a form of public engagement and historical um, representation. You can read the graphic novel stories in, in this. Please, we've, 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 brought in, we've brought lots of copies along with us this evening. Um, that, that I've got boxes of the stuff in my garage and my attic at home. Um, Sarah's desperate for, for me to get rid of some of them, so do, do take them away. But, but, but seriously, um, when we designed the project, we envisaged that they would, be in, they, would, they would attract the interest of 13, 14-year-old children at secondary school, but we found in practice that they also interest and engage preteens, kind of year six, year seven, so kind of late primary, early secondary. They're a really good way of starting a conversation about what could otherwise be a very dark and traumatic story. So if you've got kids, if you've got grandkids, if there's a kid living next door across the street, <laughs> if our third, you know, if you're thinking about being a teacher, do, you know, do take a copy away and I hope it's of, I hope it's of some value. Most recently, this graphic, this graphic novel and the Watson Street story has been used by primary pupils uh, at a Motherwell school as part of their non-fiction comprehension. So the kids, about 10 years old, read the Watson Street story. They listened to extracts from the podcast. Oh my God, I can't believe it's him. He came, he came last week. Um, that's what they said. Um, and they created newspaper articles, as you can see, in which they reported on the fire based on what they'd read. And they also drew lessons historical lessons that may be of some contemporary relevance. I won't, I won't read them out. I was very impressed that they managed to work out that the fire was 117 years ago. Uh, I'd have had to use all my fingers and toes. Now you might well ask, why work with school children on such a potentially traumatic topic? Well really, Forged by Fire has always been about identifying those most at risk of being burnt in a fire or in some other kind of an incident, a scolding incident, for example. It's also about raising awareness with our partners about the historical but also the contemporary picture. We're very, very keen to kind of marry the past and the present throughout this um, project. So let's look very briefly at some of the data. So anyway, writing um, in the late 1940, shortly after the end of the war, Burn specialist Dr. Leonard Colebrook had estimated that somewhere in the region of 50,000 people needed hospital treatment for burns and scalds injuries in England and Wales alone each year. Around 80% of these accidents happened in the home. By the mid-1950s, one major burns case was happening every single day. Now, in the majority of the cases, the victim was either a young child under the age of five or 
an older person, 65 and, and above. I mean, careful. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> careful not to upset anybody. Um, the majority of serious cases were the result of a hot liquid scold, especially to young children, involving spilt tea or a boiling pan of hot water or loose flammable clothing catching fire, often at an unguarded fireplace in the 1940s, 1950s. As Colebrook writes, the teapot and the home fire have been more deadly than the great blast furnaces and smelting plants. I love, I love that quote. It's a very powerful quote. And this was a disproportionate problem in working class homes, largely due to lack of internal space, a lack of safe amenities like heaters, and the pressures on working parents, mums especially, to have eyes in the backs of their heads when they're, when they're cooking, cleaning, and so on. Indeed, I was shocked when I read this, almost twice as many children under five in the late 40s died from burns or scolds than from road traffic accidents. But there's always been much more concern expressed about the dangers of the car and the street than the home. Moreover, there are gendered patterns, according to Colebrook. Girls tended to be burnt, boys scolded. So the way the argument, and the statistics uh, kind of bear us out, don't they, Jonathan? Um, boys are much more, Colebrook said that they're, 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 they're um, adventurous and curious. You might just say they're stupid, but they're more, they're, they're more likely than girls to pull handles down from a burning stove and, and, and suffer a scold. Girls, because of their, their loose clothing, which at this time is, 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 is very flammable, especially if you work from a working class family and you're buying um, very cheap mass produced flannelette dresses, they were much more likely to be burnt. And certainly the safety campaigns you can see here seem to bear that out. Today, the most vulnerable people continue to be children, as well as the elderly and the disabled. It's very, you know, and it's interesting just to note here, you know, that 40% of those who had a registered disability and were, you know, in Grenfell Tower didn't make it out that night. House fires remain the most common type of building fire today and are consistently the leading source of fire-related fatal and non-fatal injuries. An estimated 25,000 children attend A&E departments in England and Wales each year with a burn or a scold. So the numbers are still very, very high. Children living in areas of social deprivation are four times more likely to be burnt or scolded than those living elsewhere. And this is largely down to, to housing. So for me, the data reveals two truths, historically and contemporaneously. Firstly, contrary to the popular mantra that fire doesn't discriminate, it's almost universally the case that the poor and the vulnerable fall prey to fire because of unsafe or overcrowded housing or working conditions. We have seen how residents who raise safety concerns with landlords tend to get ignored until it's too late or dismissed as troublemakers. Politicians like to describe mass fatality fires as one-off, as accidents that they're going to learn from, they're not, that it's not going to happen again. But, his, you know, history shows us that in truth this is justification for doing the barest minimum, for following the path of least intervention, I call it. Fire safety then is a social equality issue. It's also a socio-technical one. It's about more than fire, engine and fire engineering and design. They're obviously, they're important. It's, it's about people's rights to feel safe in their homes, in their workplaces, regardless of who they are and where they're from. So as a result, improved safety is a multidisciplinary issue. So it draws upon the STEM subjects, but also the humanities and the social science Sciences this is something that we feel very, very strongly about because it's, it's us, everyone in this room really, who best know and understand the social, the political and the historical factors that determine risk. So anyway, that's the context in which we approach everything to do with Forged by Fire. So we're, we're, we've set out to inspire those we work with, as well as ourselves. To create with, with, with the children we work with resources to learn from and to share. 
um, to collaborate with our external partners in the fire service, in the Burns charities, in schools and community groups, but also to work with burn survivors themselves. It's very, very important, such as Pauline and Caroline, both of whom we interviewed, Jonathan and I interviewed Pauline in her Coventry house, um, and I interviewed Caroline um, in Swansea. And it's through this project that we commemorate, celebrate and share their stories. And both Pauline and Caroline's stories are in this graphic novel um, as a way of encouraging or inspiring people to act more safely around um, areas of risk. So at the heart of this are clearly stories. That's why I started with a story. So, you know, in order to raise awareness about safety and make a, a, a small but significant change in the communities we work with, we tell stories, but we also listen to them. We listen to Caroline and Pauline. Story-based learning is a proven strategy for engaging children because it helps make historical information more comprehensible, more relevant, and more relatable to them. Brings them home the idea that, that, that there are risks within the home. And the idea is that they then go home and they nag their parents to test the battery, you know, change the batteries in the smoke alarm, mum and dad. I want to make sure it's safe. As Sarah Dillon and Claire Craig have shown, listening to stories assists with our effective and cognitive development. So it's, and it contributes to improved decision making. So it's something we should all be doing, including politicians. So storytelling is also a political act, of course. It's an act used by activist communities. They're very active today, some of them, Grenfell United being um, the most well known, I guess. And they use stories to fight for improved social equality around health and safety and housing rights. And I explore all these in my latest book. So stories can be painful. They can also be redemptive. They inspire. And they might just cause some behavioural change. They've been used to good effect by the Children's Burns Trust, one of our partners, which shares stories from survivors or from the parents of young children who have been burnt. Because these are the stories that have the best chance of being listened to, because they're rooted in experience of flame. So Jonathan and I contributed the story of Pauline here, who spent several years in a burned unit in the West Midlands, following a life-changing firework injury at the age of seven in the late 1950s. Pauline was told she would never lead a quote-unquote normal life. She'd never have children. When she spoke to Jonathan and I in the living room of her Coventry home, what was her name? Nan. She'd proven the doctors wrong. Caroline similarly. She received burns to 75% of her body as a child in the late 80s whilst trying to rescue her younger sister from a house fire in Swansea. She's pictured here alongside um, Anne Jones, who was the Labour member for the Welsh Assembly. Together, they campaigned to get sprinklers installed in all new build, multi-storey residential premises in Wales. Practice that bit. <laughs> Wonderful. Using her experience to campaign for improved safety. She said, money, money is just a bit of paper. You can't put a value on life. Well, the English ministers at the same time did exactly that. And they refused to legislate for improved safety following the coroner's report into the Lacanal house fire in 2009. So anyway... When it comes to working with school children, um, such as these pictured here, I've been really impressed by just how much they've engaged the project. They've not been put off by some of the darker aspects of the stories. Been really open to it, and I think that's really good. And they've, they've come into the fold as co-creators. And it's really interesting to note, one of the activities we always do is we get, we get the kids to make pledge cards. Sometimes we call them pledge speech bubbles, don't we, Irene? So they write something that they're gonna do so, you know, a changed behaviour, changed attitude, something that's just been reinforced by the workshops that we've done with them. And it's just interesting just to, to, just to note how wide they've gone in their interpretation of the stories. So by doing this, our aim has been to produce engaged histories, to encourage students to think with history. And by that, we mean to learn the historian's craft, 
but also to contribute creatively to our outputs, to things like this. And if that leads to small amounts of behavioural change or reminds them just to be safety when they come into contact with flame, that's all the better. Because as John Tosh argues, thinking with history performs a vital role in supporting the function of democratic societies. Now, obviously, much has been written about um, the pedagogical value of storytelling and creativity in schools' education since the millennium, especially by many colleagues here at Leeds Beckett in the School of Ed. Creativity has, as they write, been um, commodified and politicised by successive governments who have sort of shifted away from more traditional fun or aesthetic elements of learning to trying to create, produce well-rounded, um, productive workers to work in the creative economy. Teachers and children, as we re repeatedly hear, Irene, have had their creativity stymied. So what we did is we've set out to kind of challenge that in a small way by creating inclusive fun lessons around something that shouldn't be fun. So, so far, we've worked with pushing 200 school children across primary and secondary schools in the north of England and Scotland. Another 40 odd to come in a couple of months, isn't there, Jonathan? We've been inspired by several campaigns that have called rec in recent years to unlock children's potential in the wake of the COVID pandemic. I'll just cite one. Andy Burnham, the, the Labour Mayor for Greater Manchester, has, has called for children to learn about regional tragedies. So things like the Hillsborough tragedy of 1989 or the Peterloo massacre of 1819. And he says these should be learned on a regional basis by kids from, that, from those areas. Because one, it will help them develop their interest in local histories, but also it will help build resilience and empathy in a, in a post-COVID world. I would add Bradford, the fire at Bradford City in 1985 to that list. This is the fire we've used most consistently with schools, both in Bradford, but also further afield in Darlington. What kids in Darlington know about the Bradford fire? It was amazing how much they got out of it. Bradford's proven to be an iconic fire for a number of reasons, for three main reasons. Firstly, because it's, it's still part of our our collective contemporary memory of the 80s as a decade of disasters. But also because it took place in a city that was going through tumultuous social and economic change at the time. This means it allows us to explore um, the contextualised history of Bradford and of, of the fire together. So we're able to connect the story of the fire with bigger themes, broader themes I should say, around migration around women's access to work, and around the social history of football. Secondly, it was amazing, Aaron and I had a great time in the Bradford archives discovering all these pictures, poems, letters, cards that children across the country were sending to Bradford City Council in the weeks that followed the fire, enclosed you know, pocket money and money that they'd, they'd, they'd raise through fundraising activities. So if there's a cultural and creative response at the time, then it lends itself to a similar response today to remember, to build legacy. And then thirdly, public memory of the fire um, takes the form of official, but also grassroots cultural expressions by the club each, each year, by the city council, by local schools who lost children in the, in the flames. So the example here is Ashley and Craig, brother and sister, who, and, and the plaque hangs in Beckford Thornton Secondary School in Bradford, and they remember those two students in particular each May. Other communities affected by the events included the residents of Manningham, a, a, a British Asian inner city community that surrounded the stadium. One of our stories centred on the role of British Asian families who provided help and comfort to distraught fans. They offered cups of tea, drinks of water, blankets, access to telephones to call loved ones. Let's watch a short clip that shows you some of the activities that we've done as part of some of these workshops. It's voiced by Irene, who's in the centre, and Rachel Wood, our project facilitators, so you get a break from me. 
I think in terms of the first day, it was about that confidence, because not all the students knew each other, or knew their names, etc., and that comfortableness between the, the lasses and the lads being involved together, and introducing a bit of fun, as well as the fact that they are things that you would do in drama, um, and they're a good way of listening and observing, which is what you need to do if you're doing a historical project in terms of research, that that's important to do. We have designed this workshop to be very flexible so that you can sort of take parts of it and develop some and maybe miss out a little bit, which is what we did when we were there. And that worked in the sense that um, we worked with the group that we had and we picked out what they, would, they really wanted to develop. Um, we worked with their strengths, we, work, we worked on their challenges, but some of the tasks where we went into detail and depth, that takes time. It takes time, and the, the more time you spend, then the better learning you actually get. The value that you put on different tasks as well, I think is really important. Oh, very good. Well, you, missed the, you missed the historical reenactment. Um, I should say all, all of our videos, all of our resources, are available on our project website. Um, scan the QR code if you can. Thank you to Ash <laughs> for making this for me. I think it might run out in the next day or two, um, but we've got, a, we've, got a, we've got a website um, where we share a lot of this material, so do, do take a look at it, and if you can't find it, just, just send me an email. Um, another of our stories concerned this man. This is Dr. David Sharp the consultant surgeon who led up the team who provided medical care to the many hundreds of people who were treated for burns injuries in local hospitals. Sharp went on to head up the, um, the, the, the Plastic Surgery and Burns Research Unit at the University of Bradford. His specialist work in patient care was used in subsequent incidents such as the King's Crossfire two years later. David sadly passed on earlier this year. We shared, so we shared stories about Dr. Sharp and some of, the, some of our other unsung heroes with school children across Bradford. And you can see what they've done here is they've extrapolated historical factual information and they've mapped it against the Top Trumps template. Because why wouldn't you? We're looking for heroes here. Then what we next did is we went to Beckford Thornton School and we worked with Year 9s. And we encouraged them to create graphic narratives focusing on their chosen characters. Some went went for historic, you know, went for historical characters, real people. Um, others changed them in order to um, reflect Bradford's diversity. So Dr. Sharp becomes Dr. Rahana, um, a young, socially mobile, educated British Asian female surgeon called into work on her day off. And then that gets to, so it gets, it gets storyboarded and then it gets turned into a graphic novel. They did all this themselves. Soundtracked um, by Sia's hit single, Cheap Thrills. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, but it was all the rage in 2018, 19. But the story's, in, you know, the, the exercise is important because it projected the kids' own aspirations, both as artists and storytellers, but equally because they were all first-generation kids wanting to go to university. And I thought that was really good. We, we spoke a lot. They asked lots of questions. I flag up Dr. Rahana here because she's taken on an agency of her own since then, since her creation. So we turned her video, we, we turned her story into a video, or Aaron and Marcus did, voiced by pupils at Beckford Thornton, and it's embedded in our interactive story map, which is on our website. It'll take too long to upload it. Dr. Rahana then became a central character in our time shift drama workshop last year. Um, so Irene uh, created a series of three scripts centred on conversations that our main characters might, might have had ten minutes before the events of the fire, or the notification of the fire, in the case of Dr Rahana, before she gets the, before she gets the phone call telling her she's needed in theatre. So these, this workshop, drama workshop was a way in which we engaged the, the students to explore the contextualised life stories of, of second-generation British Asians like, like Rahana through a fictionalised phone conversation with her mum. So it helps, helps them to put both the, the fire, the story of the fire and the people's um, life stories into a wider um, historical and contemporary context. So let's see what the kids made of it. So here's a short clip of two year 10 pupils from Herworth School in Darlington. This is Sam and Jessica 
telling Dr. Rahana's story through a phone conversation with her mum. All right, so this is Dr. Rahana before the fire starts, before she gets the phone call to go to work once again to start a shift again and to deal with the burns. And she's talking to her mum on the phone and she doesn't care what her mum's talking about because her mum has very differing opinions to her. She talks differently. She wants different things for Rahana that she doesn't want. So she's very unreliable. She doesn't see her mum talking the way she actually is. It's all gibberish, it's all back and forwards. There's no proper speech. The sentences aren't properly formed because she sees it as just idiocy. She doesn't care and she thinks it's just stupid. So eventually her mum's finished. She hangs up on Rahana. Rahana is getting ready to go out. She watches the game. But before she can actually have any enjoyment, the phone goes again. She has to go back to work. Every teenager ever, isn't it? <laughs> My mum's stupid. Um, let's go straight into another clip, right? Um, this time it's from a different school. This is Beckford Upper Heaton School in Bradford. Um, here, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. All right, so. Here, the, the, these are year eight and year nine pupils reflecting on their involvement with the project and what they got out of it. We're gonna start and end with Gabriella here. These guys, are, these, these guys are so clever. Anyway, yesterday when we were first asked if we like drama, I was like, uh, like, n not really, but now I actually realise that drama is like, it brings people's creative side out and it's actually interesting because I thought it was going to be this nerve-wracking thing where you have to put, like do all types of performances and crazy things, but it's actually fun and being around new people that you don't usually talk to in school, so like, yeah, it brought my confidence side out. Uh, the drama workshop has made me feel different about history as uh, it lets me get um, a more deeper insight as to different cultures and how different people have affected, uh, have been affected by the Bradford fire, uh, especially as in like, the Bangladeshi community as they live near the fire and many of them uh, uh, struggled with the fire and um, uh, they were very deeply affected and uh, overall it just gives me a better interpretation about how um, history is perceived across different people. Oh, bright well, lad. When you understand that history isn't just about wars and big <laughs> events that happen everywhere. It sometimes it happens locally and actually a lot of things happen locally here in Bradford as well. I thought drama drama would be like <laughs> a bit boring and a bit like I I don't know how to explain it. A bit robot movement. <laughs> when we see drama and like people reenacting what happened, it just makes it more real and it makes you think about what happened and how sad and how it affects people's lives and how tragic it was. Yeah, so it made me think different about tra tragedy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love the fact that the young lads there just like, yeah, you go for it. You're you're great. You just talk. These kids, these kids knew what they were talking about, didn't they? Clearly. Um, so a lot of what we do in our public engagement is grounded in the ethos of partnership. So for the final stretch of my lecture. Um, I'm going to tell you about a partnership that I've been working on for a number of years now. Uh, so I've worked with the Fire Brigade Union, the Silk Ased, on a variety of its historical projects and campaigns. And this includes the FBU's Red Plaque Scheme, which it launched in 2017 um, and has since then recognised more than, I think, more than 70 firefighters who lost their lives in the line of duty now. So the scheme's really important for anchoring firefighters in their local communities in leaving a legacy for those same communities to research their own histories. And so we started to think we need to bring the children into the fold here to think about, you know, longer term legacies um, beyond the, the really important, and really lovely ceremony that happens every time a red plaque is, is erected. So I'm very, very proud to have been involved with three red plaques working alongside union officials, serving firefighters, local community groups and schools. And so they are from left to right. Um, Solomon Belinsky, um, a Polish born um, upholsterer, um, Leeds, you know, Leeds based, he, worked, he, he served in the, in the auxiliary fire service and lost his life due to injuries sustained during the Leeds Blitz in 1941. His red plaque is located outside a former operational fire station that is now a community centre in the heart of Gipton, uh, uh, an area in East Leeds. 
Second, we have Jeff, Na uh, uh, Jeff Naylor, the quiet hero. Jeff received fatal burns rescuing young children from a house fire in Keighley in 1983. His plaque is in a local park around the corner from, from, the, from, from the street. And then on the right, we have Joseph Calderwood and Stanley McIntosh there. Um, two firefighters who were killed um, in Lanarkshire. They died as a result of an explosion in a paint store at a steelworks in Motherwell in January 1963. And this most recent example um, was, it came about through a partnership that we developed with the FBU, with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in Lanarkshire, and with a local primary school called Nowtop. So we created a series of four workshops in the schools. Each Friday from November, in November, December, it was really tiring. It was really hard work, but really rewarding, Jonathan, wasn't it? Um, based around story-based learning, um, around the theme of remembrance. In fact, our first workshop was on Remembrance Day in November. Activities included role-playing the fatal accident inquiry, uh, creating clay plaques dedicated to the children's heroes. Lots of pets were involved there. And taking part in a mock fire investigation with the service's operational fire dog called Phoenix. As you can imagine, that was a real highlight for the children and Jonathan. <laughs> So the collaboration culminated, as you can see, at Motherwell Fire Station in January of this year, where we unveiled a red plaque to remember the two men. This was the largest ceremony yet run by the FBU because you've got 30-odd 10-year-olds ten, ten who all wanted to be part of the ceremony, and, they, and we made sure that they were. So it was a really inspiring event, as you can see from the teacher's quote here, um, to see the different groups coming together, school children, firefighters, both serving and retired, union officials, and the families of the two men. It's a really inspiring way to bring um, them all together to commemorate and celebrate the firefighters' lives. As well, you know, it's not all about the, you know, their passing. And to leave a material legacy in the form of a red plaque. Don't just take my word for it. Let's hear the kids. Got to whack the volume up here. Callum, isn't it? Is that Callum? I think. Yeah, absolutely amazing. And, and yeah, freely talking in a way that I haven't been able to this evening. So fantastic. They'll put me out of a job in 20 years or so. Um, really good. We're really excited. We're going back to Motherwell next month. Really excited about it to start to build a legacy project with them. These kids are about to go to secondary school. So we want them to tell next year's cohort what they should be learning from um, the plaque and, and the project. And this takes me to my final, final couple of slides. I won't, I won't take up very many minutes. Um, this is about next steps. Um, so firstly, <clears throat> so the first book from the project is coming out this summer in July in open access, so it's free. Um, I insisted upon it. 
Um, you can scan the QR code to see the table of contents if it's still working. Um, the book, uh, it, was a, it was a challenging one for me to write uh, during the, the, the pandemic, um, but it basically traces successive governments' failures to learn from multiple fatality fires, the vast majority of which have been long forgotten, the victims particularly so, because they tend to be poor and marginalised. It also argues that civil servants and politicians should think with history in order to produce better policy. They should basically be more like those children we've heard from. So the book situates the fire, the Grenfell fire that is, into a much longer term history, um, tracing the evolution of building and fire regulations and fire safety regimes across the 20th century. But especially from the 1970s through to the 1990s, when there are huge changes and a major gear shift in how multiple governments, to be fair, um, but especially the, the 79 to 90 conservative government, um, saw a shift in policy and practice when it comes to the way that the state views its regulation of public safety and kind of placing greater emphasis on individuals to regulate their own, you know, their own practices, their own workplaces, their own homes. So, you know, hence the, the use of deregulation in the title. It's a history of deregulation. It sounds really boring, doesn't it? Um, this move, I argue, has done little to protect those who are most vulnerable to fire. You know, both in the UK, but also elsewhere. You know, and, you know, um, the recent hostile fire in Wellington, New Zealand, is a, is a horrible reminder of that, of course. Secondly, we're building towards a follow-on bid which seeks to develop the partnership ethos in community fire safety. Stories will remain at the core, but the focus now is on harnessing virtual reality to create more historically immersive stories that teach lessons that stick for a, for a much longer period with our audiences. As the Times Education Commission report uh, a couple of years ago set out, students are demanding more creative learning, especially using VR. They want their history lessons to be more interactive, more experiential, to connect the past and the present in interesting novel ways. How are we going to do that with mass fatality fires? Um, we're basing this chapter around cinema fire safety. And one of our stories is the, the Glen Cinema disaster of Christmas 1929 in Scotland. I do pick cheery stories to share, don't I? Anyway, it will involve a historical reenactment of a cinema evacuation in Armley. Watch this space. It's going to be a ride. I'm going to end. This is my final slide. I'm going to end with the up-to-date advice on Burns First Aid issued by the British Burns Association. There's a copy in the back of the in, in, in the back of the, the graphic novel. We got told off because we'd had, we, originally we had the wrong advice. We had, we had the old advice. We were rightly pulled to task on it by, by, by a very, very dear friend and partner of the project, thankfully. Um, cool, cool, cover. Cool the burn. Lots, you know, run a tap if you can. Use lots of cool running water over the burn within, you know, for 20 minutes, within about three hours of the injury. Then, call somebody who knows what they're talking about. Call a medical professional to assess the situation, decide if more help is required. And cover it if you can. Cover it to prevent infection. Um, if you've got cling film, use strips, use very loose strips laid over the burn. Don't wrap it tight. If you wrap it tight, it's got to come off and that's going to hurt. If you don't have cling film, use a clean, non-fluffy non cloth or some other kind of material. Again, you don't want something that's fluffy because you'll be picking bits out, right? Um, pay attention to that. You might, you, you might find it useful in the future. Thanks for listening. When I joined uh, Leeds Beckett uh, University, I read the strategic plan and in it, it said uh, the purpose uh, of, of our university is to make a positive and decisive difference to uh, individuals, organizations and communities. And I think what you've seen today is a masterclass of how that tr translates 
into the context of history and what is actually a tremendously sensitive and critical subject and how to deal with this in both a really uh, rigorous, innovative way and to teach the next generation about it. So fabulous. Thank you very much, Professor Ewan. I, I, I read that same strategic plan as well, Silke, okay, yes. <laughs> uh, we've got a bit of time for, uh, for Q&A, so uh, over to, uh, to the audience. Brendan. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just curious, what's the backstory? How did you get into this topic in the first place? Uh, teenage pyromania. <laughs> um, uh, don't all teenage boys play with fire? <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I could I could come up with a with, yeah with an exciting um, answer, Brendan. the 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 truth is, Chris will Chris will know this, and Richard. I mean, I was re I I started out by researching the the police, the police service. I was really fascinated by a very arcane administrative body called the Watch Committee, uh, that basically managed police forces from 1835 through to the 19 <laughs> the abolition in when Chris 1974. Oh, I can't remember. I haven't worked. 64. Sorry, sorry, mate. Sorry. Um, why do you think I didn't talk about the history tonight? Uh, so, I, so, but I was drawn to the fire service because I, I, I just stum I stumbled across in the archives references to police fire brigades. I was like, what are they? What's a police fire brigade? And so I started doing some digging around, you know, lots of, lots of cities, Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham, they, all, they, all, they were all protected by these combined services, a way of saving money, obviously, in, through, through local government. You know, Chris, yeah, you, you know all about it, won't you, Chris? So I spotted a, a gap in the historiographical market is the really boring reason why I got interested in them. And then I just became, I, just meeting and talking with firefighters, with others who, who you know, in the, in the burn sector, are really captured by just how much they wanted to make a difference. They wanted to help people, and, you know, firefighters, Heather, you might remember this, uh, once at an open day many, many years ago, a father said to me, why fires? He asked the same question. My answer was, I'm passionate about firefighters. <laughs> Will that do? <laughs> Chris now leaves. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask you a question now. So, <laughs> nothing about firefighters, although I know you like them. Very much. Never mind. <laughs> Um, yeah, obviously I've known you a long time, Shane, and it's really interesting hearing your passion talking about <coughs> this. Obviously, you've talked a lot about the impact of the project. That's mm. what we're so you know, fond of, impact. I'm, what I'm sort of interested to know is how it's impacted you <laughs> doing the work on the schools and with communities. Do you think mm. it's changed you as a historian or as ha in how you approach your historical, you know, your sources, your material, your writings? Yeah, yes, absolutely. It absolutely has in, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, I think it's also, I think it's changing me as a person as well. I think I'm still taking that journey to being more empathetic and kinder. Sarah's, Sarah's, Sarah's I'm, I'm trying not to get eye contact. I think as a historian, I think, I think the difference is in the, t the two books, I think. The Fighting Fires book, which in many ways is a fairly conventional history of local government, of structures, of legislation. Very important. It was filling a gap. Nobody had written about it since the 1950s. Um, whereas the most recent book gives a voice to the communities, gives a voice to the survivor groups. I had to Certain things had to be had to be adapted because of because of COVID, because of closure of archives and things like that. But yeah, giving giving a voice um, to those who lack one, for want of a better word, because they're victims, because they've they've passed on, or because their families and they feel like nobody's speaking out on their behalf and what. So I feel like yeah, I feel like I'm I feel like I'm, be I'm a better historian or more rounded historian for it. Um, I suppose the other thing that's changed me is working here. I've been here long enough. <laughs> um, when I came, I was, a, a, you know, yeah, when I came, I was very political focused in my history. 
And then I discovered, thanks to wonderful colleagues, I've discovered cultural history. Yeah. And that was, <laughs> that was a massive eye-opener for me. Um, and so, yeah, dealing with the kind of cultural testimonies and legacies of these events is really interesting as well. What a question there. Yeah. <coughs> um, I joined the fire service in 1978, and the fire death um, situation then was horrendously high. Yes. 500 a year or something like that. Um, we've clearly moved on through a lot of what you're saying in the sense of fire safety in the home and Kim Butler's mm. now turned community <coughs> safety. Mm. Um, I, I believe there are sort of two silos, I don't know what your view is on, on it, but that's worked very well. Um, and as no doubt your uh, new book will sort of relate to the legislative, yeah, sorry, legislative side in relation to commercial premises or mm. unfortunately high-rise buildings are actually within the commercial zone as far as we're concerned. Yeah. Um, clearly tr the tragedy in Grenfell sort of highlighted that whole issue which is got lots of problems behind it in relationship to construction. Mm. Um, do you think that will still go along in the sense of we'll end up with another tragedy within, because that's, I think that's certainly my view. Another Grenfell. Y yeah. Um, and how that again will reverberate down the... Oops, uh, pathway into the past and all the other events that sort of yeah. you can relate to. Yeah, yeah. We don't seem to learn the lessons. Well, they le yeah, I mean, they les lessons, are, lessons are always learnt, always learnt through public inquiries, departmental inquiries and such like. But then they just get, they get forgotten, they get shelved, yeah, absolutely. And we've seen that with some of the recommendations from the phase one inquiry report following, you know, uh, the Grenfell, especially around personal emergency evacuation plans. They didn't get shelved, they just got rejected. Not worth it. Not worth the, the, the expense. And that again, that, that replicates similar sorts of conversations that were being had in the 1980s around hostels, around house, what we call houses in multiple occupation, houses, you know, lived in multiple groups of, 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 pe of you know, people who aren't connected by family, student halls of residence being one. There's awful questions about, you know, Caroline says you can't put a value on life, but politicians do. I mean, they, have, they kind of have to, you know, civil servants have to. Um, will there be another Grenfell? Yeah. Yeah, I suspect so. Um, I suspect it, 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 it might well happen. Um, or it'll be, it'll be a different kind of fire. It'll be a slightly different circumstances. So it's different. You know, but in the, the book, in the book, I argue it's not about learning lessons from fires, really. It's about thinking as a historian, acting as a historian. So we know, we know, all the students, all, all my colleagues here, we know what effort it takes to do historical research, to do the legwork, the donkey work in the archives. Sifting the paper trail, to borrow a term from a housing journalist, Pete Apps. Um, we know what it takes to think and act historically. And if the policymakers and other stakeholders are able to think similarly, to be critical, to be reflective on their sources, then there could be, <laughs> there could be change. You know, and I make you know I make the case that there needs to be a cultural change at the heart of government. Really, there needs to be a change of government. There needs to be a cultural change at the heart. Of um, I think that is probably the best way in which. <laughs> I'm sure as your colleagues have questions. There is an opportunity here downstairs to mingle, ask questions, have a drink, and some nibbles. Uh, just before we do that. Thank you once again, Professor Shane Ewan, for giving us a brilliant inaugural lecture today. Thank you. Thank you.